brothers and sisters. We are here today because we are tired and we are saying enough is enough. America's public education began in a one-room schoolhouse, much like the Churchville Schoolhouse built in 1846, and now part of the Elmhurst History Museum in Illinois. However, by the 1930s, our schools morphed into factory-like buildings, vast and institutional. A once straightforward curriculum grew from reading, writing, and arithmetic to include the sciences, arts, foreign languages, and college prep courses. With such rich educational opportunities in a nation with the world's most powerful economy, how is it that the United States ranks in the bottom half of all nations in mathematics and ranks squarely in the middle of all developed countries in its reading scores, behind such nations as Germany, Poland, and Vietnam? Why is it that more than 60% of all fourth and eighth grade students can't read with proficiency? Why are 40 to 44 million adults living in the U.S. functionally illiterate, lacking adequate reading scores required for daily life? Why does family income and race have such an enormous influence on whether a student graduates from high school or instead becomes one of the nation's 750,000 dropouts each year? I'm Patricia Brown Holmes, president of the Chicago Bar Association. We're honored to present a candid discussion about educational inequality in America, myths, realities, and seeds for success in public education. Welcome, my name is Steve Tozer. Our program today will examine educational inequality in America, partly by focusing on schools that succeed despite the odds. Since Thomas Jefferson twice tried and failed to persuade Virginia taxpayers to establish a state system of public schools, public education in the U.S. has been a topic of considerable controversy. Some of the nation's most difficult challenges, such as racial equality, women's rights, or equal treatment of people with disabilities, have played out in classrooms, hallways, and on the front steps of schools. Public schools were supposed to be engines of democracy but they often turned out to be protectors of inequality. And today, inequalities in public education continue to face the nation. This is a long-standing issue, as Professor James D. Anderson, one of the nation's foremost education historians, explains. The campaigns for state-mandated public education started in the colonial period in the early 19th century. University of Illinois professor James D. Anderson says illiteracy was rampant across America around 1800. Most people lived and worked on farms. About 80% of the population couldn't read or write. But the issue for public education was not so much to foster literacy, but really to foster character, culture, and national identity. Anderson says leaders in the public education movement viewed the lack of education as a social disease and felt it was the responsibility of the state to provide schooling for its citizens. Most students at the time, who could afford it, attended private schools. Public schools were viewed as charity. They looked down on public schools. This was a place where the poor and the weak um, and the um, um, unfortunate went uh, to school. I do not wish to see sloppy, slovenly penmanship in my schoolhouse. Is that clear? One-room schoolhouses began springing up across the country by the mid-1800s as public education started to take hold. When America's industrial age kicked into high gear, it had a profound impact on education. Titans of industry such as Rockefeller and Carnegie, the meatpacking industry, and the railroads were all admired for their efficiency and productivity. Educators took notice and they began to model education very much on the cult of efficiency, including buildings. It made sense that they would build buildings accordingly. High school buildings resembled factory buildings and grew in size to handle the country's growing student population. 
They were built as schools for mechanical arts, mechanical drawings, a kind of combination of vocation and classical curriculum. Anderson says after World War II, public education mushroomed. People felt the need to go to high school and get a diploma to be accepted by society. Still, two-thirds of the country's civilian workforce in the 1950s were high school dropouts. But by the 1960s, if you didn't have a high school diploma, there was a stigma attached to you as a failure. Today's economy has shifted away from manufacturing to information technology. Anderson says public education has to keep pace with those changes. You have to have spaces for students to have computers, to use computers, to use technology, to become extremely competent uh, with technology because that's what fuels the economy now. To discuss what we know about how our nation can best face today's educational challenges, joining us are three highly respected and influential educators. Dr. Jerry Wiest, former superintendent of schools in Montgomery County, Maryland, near Washington, D.C. Dr. Linda Darling Hammond of Stanford University, and Dr. Charles Payne of University of Chicago. I'm gonna begin with some recent history. In 1970, the American city that had the highest per capita income was Detroit. At that time, a person without a high school education could work in the factories, raise a family, and send his or her, her children to college. But those days are now gone. What kind of education does every child need today if he or she is going to have a chance at a rewarding economic and personal life? And are we providing that education to our young people? Let's start with Dr. Darling Hammond on that one. What kind of education do we need to provide today? Well, one of the things that's critical is that we've had this knowledge explosion in the United States uh, and around, around the world. Uh, and the expectations for what you need to be able to do are very different than they were back in the days when you could take your lunchbox to the factory in Detroit and you know, make that a great living wage. Um, I am a um, Stanford professor, so I don't like to quote people from Cal Berkeley, but there are some professors there have been studying the growth of knowledge in the world, and there was more new knowledge created in the world between 1999 and 2003 than in the entire history of the world preceding. Technology knowledge is doubling every 11 months at this point. So the young people who we're preparing to go out into the workplace will have to work with knowledge that hasn't been discovered yet, using technologies that haven't been invented yet to solve these massive problems that we haven't managed to solve. That means that you can't just take some facts and divide them up into 12 years of schooling and tell kids to memorize them and spit them back. They've gotta be able to find knowledge, weigh and balance evidence, uh, figure out what matters, uh, design things, uh, solve problems, do that collaboratively. Uh, what many people call the 21st century skills uh, that are critical thinking, problem solving, uh, communication, collaboration kinds of skills are gonna be needed for everyone. We've often organized schools to provide those skills for a minority of kids in the honors track, in the advanced placement program, in the affluent suburbs. But we have not organized our schools to provide that kind of education for all of our kids. And that's what we have to do. So the challenges to education that we're now facing really are different than the challenges we were facing even 100 years ago, dramatically different. Even 20 different. years ago. Even 20 years ago. Uh, Dr. Payne, what's your take on some of this? No, I mean, I, I, that's hard to improve on. The one thing I would specify, though, uh, I worked for a number of years with Bob Moses, and if, if you guys know sort of what he has become in the, the last few decades, his position, he, he who comes out of the civil rights movement in Mississippi, has been arguing that in order to be a citizen in this country now, you have to have a much higher level of quantitative literacy than, than, than we have thought about before. You weren't really a citizen in this country in the late 19th century unless you had literacy, unless you could read, right? It became a uh, prerequisite to so many things that, that, you, that you wanted to participate in. That's changed now. It, it's quantitative literacy mm -hmm. is gonna be the key, the gateway um, to young people having the kinds of lives they want to have. Mm -hmm. And um, Dr. Wiest, uh, Linda Darling Hammond is suggesting that some students are having more access to these kinds of literacy than other students. And therein lies 
a fundamental piece of the problem behind our discussion today. What's your take on the extent to which we're facing a period of education inequality right now? It's huge. I think it shows up in uh, the wealth divide. I think it shows up in the housing divide, the digital divide. All of the great divides are out there. Uh, it is all at the root of those divides is educational inequality. And as we have changed our workforce and as we have changed our lives, we've also resegregated. We've not only resegregated our communities, we've resegregated our schools. And I think that it is harder right now for social mobility to occur, upward mobility, than it was in the 1950s and 60s. And we have less of it. It's, uh, it's more problematic if you're born in a poor family today than it was if you were born a poor family when I was born. What's yeah. the evidence that each of you thinks about when you think about the whole question of whether we are in a period of education inequality. I mean, the, there's a, an extent to which twas ever thus, right? I mean, the reality is this is a society that's never delivered equal education across the board to all population groups. Um, why does it seem to matter so much now? What's the evidence of inequality and why does it matter? Well, we're at a period where you can't really engage the society and the economy unless you're well educated. I mean, there was a time where you know, you could get a good job, raise a family, and all of that without much education because there was a lot of work in factories and on farms that was routine work that you did over and over again. Uh, those jobs have been outsourced or digitized. They are somewhere else. There are very few in the economy. Uh, so, so the nature of the society has changed. So you, you, you need the, uh, almost everyone to have a very high level of education. The, Symptoms of the inequality are, are, are around us everywhere. I mean, you can sort of see what it looks like. Um, it is true that we fund our schools more inequitably than any other industrialized country in the world. Uh, so in uh, uh, Illinois, there's a four to one ratio between the highest spending and the lowest spending schools. In most states, it's two or three to one ratio. Across the country, states spend different amounts of money. There's the highest spending district in America spends 10, 10 times as much as the lowest spending. And kids get radically different educations. You can go to campuses in wealthy communities that have swimming pools and large fields and computers on every desk, and the kids are studying the Dow Jones averages. And you can go to schools that are crumbling, which are unsafe, where there's not heat in the winter and air conditioning in the summer, where uh, there aren't enough desks for the kids where the class sizes are 40 or more, where uh, it's hard to keep uh, qualified teachers because the salaries are low and the working conditions are poor, where there aren't enough textbooks and not even to mention, you know, getting access to the internet and computers. And that's the reality of inequality in this country in the education system. But you can do something about it. I mean, uh, we're in a global economy. People can team up. If these two eminent researchers want to talk to somebody in a different country, just like that. They can get on their little machines and bingo and carry on a conversation. So the wealth or the educational attainment uh, is exacerbated by that world view. But our kids, and we have four in our family, need jobs and they're gonna to have to learn for these jobs. But we can do something about it as a country, and we're gonna to have to because what we are running into is that you have an increase in crime, you have an increase in social unrest, you have an increase in anger. You can see that being played out in elections right now. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that stems from the inequality of the educational opportunity. It stems from a lot of the issues that we have that bubble up socially stem from our lack of delivery of a good education for all children. So I agree with those circumstances. What I don't agree with is the fact that we think that we can't change those conditions. And there are states that have, for example, taken that bull by the horns. California just passed a very progressive school funding system, which will fund schools based on pupils' needs. And right. so you get more money for a child in poverty who's an English learner or foster care child, uh, more money still if they're in concentrated poverty. That will completely reverse centuries 
of funding that was really going to make the rich richer and the poor poorer. Um, you know, in, and that's happened in a few few other places. So people do do make progress on these issues, but we have a lot of progress. Um, that money needs alone to be made. is probably not going to totally. It's how you spend the money, and how well, you first you have to have it. You in have order to have to spend it, but then you so have I to just, spend it. Just want to make so that I'm not, clear. I'm not, I'm not okay. discounting the money, but it's, it's important that you spend it correctly yeah, too. Absolutely. Dr. Absolutely. Payne wants to break in. No, I, I, I just wanted to say that I actually learned this morning that a similar bill is in the uh, legislature here in Illinois that, that was just introduced. Now, who knows how much, how far it'll go, and how crazy. A political situation right now, but I'm just glad that some people in the state are, are beginning to think about the inequities in, in funding. funding. Well, every state uh, just about has a school finance lawsuit going on. Uh, Forty plus states have school finance lawsuits because of the inequality. That's right. Just about every state has its state bird, its state flag, and its state school finance lawsuit where yeah. people are trying to litigate these issues, and Illinois has mm -hmm. had its share of that. So. Uh, but we had in California, we had a governor who said to the legislature, I will not sign any bill until you give me a bill that um, fixes this school funding system. And he stu stood by that, vetoed, you know, lots and lots of bills until people said, oh, he might even be serious about that. And it's interesting that, uh, as you've pointed out, that some states have far more equitable funding systems than others. Right. Uh, Illinois happens to be one of the least equitable. Uh, but uh, Illinois does not stand alone. In other words, we have quite a number of states that have deeply inequitable systems that actually provide fewer, fund, fewer dollars of funding to those who need it most, where other states actually reverse that formula. But I, 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 I am a proud son of the state of New Jersey, which illustrates two sides of this argument. Mm -hmm. um, it is one of the states that was, was early on uh, uh, in, in line to do something about funding inequities. One of the positives to come out of that is a really high quality preschool program in, in, in I think 31 urban areas of New Jersey right now, uh, reducing gaps by race and class 20 to 40 percent uh, for the children who get as much as two years. Re it's, it's, it's a big win. On the other hand, right, uh, my sense is that most, only a s small number of the districts in New York outside of the, pre um, in New Jersey, I mean, outside of the preschool program, were, were really able to use the influx of cash. And some of it had to do with the issues, I think, that, yeah. that Jerry is thinking about. If you don't have leadership, if you don't have an educational vision, if you are, are deeply caught up in racial politics, and before you leave the stage, Mr. Weiss, I want you to talk about race. I right? will. I'll talk about race. I, I don't know <laughs> of another superintendent who confronted the racial issues as, as forthrightly as, as he did. Right? But, but, but that just makes the pay. Yes, Money is the platform. Right? Money is you the platform. can't do it without this at the scale and the depth that we need it. But money by itself is not a guarantee of anything. So we're going to actually come to that issue with some focus and also the race issue in a few minutes. Um, one issue that really surfaced in your comments, Jerry, was what we really are expecting of our schools and what we're expecting of our systems. And um, we often fail to have high enough expectations for our kids. Uh, and they perform to those expectations, scholars tell us. So we've asked edu educators and members of the public to actually comment on this question of expectations. Let's take a look. It's really not a question of whether or not stu all students can do well. It's, it's really a question of whether or not all students have the opportunity to do well. The grand promise of public education is that it delivers the American dream. It tells us that children can be upwardly mobile regardless of where they came from. We have a systemic breakdown. The way that we approach public schools, the system that we've put in place, isn't working the way it needs to and it isn't working for all kids. Not speaking the dominant language is not an indicator of a level of intelligence is not a predictor of whether or not a student can do well in school or not. We deserve a system that fully supports those students and provides the added supports so that they will, uh, no doubt, that they will achieve as well as any other student in the state. It costs different amounts to educate different kids. A kid who's living in poverty, we need to spend more to make sure that that child meets their goals, meets their objectives, learns what they need to learn, and is truly ready to go out and be successful in the world. It costs more to do that. And if we begin to say, because of your background, because of the language spoken in your home, because of the color of your skin, 
It's just not realistic to think that we can change your outcomes and support you in being successful, then we're resigning ourselves to saying that public education merely, merely serves the purpose of reinforcing the stratification that exists in our society today. A couple of big ticket items got raised there. One of them was resources, right? Another one is expectations and the connection between those two things. Um, if we're not expecting that much, we don't really have to put much more resources into the issue than we currently are. What are some of your reactions to what you just saw a number of educators from, all from Chicago um, and from the state of Illinois uh, commenting about there? I think your statement that expectations and resources well spent in the right ways have to go together is key because we have sometimes had this idea that, well, let's just raise the expectations. Sometimes that takes the form of an exit exam or some other, uh, but, but without investment. And we've just come through an era under No Child Left Behind of testing without investing. Um, so expectations have to come with the resources to, to meet those, and those mean you know, thoughtful, well-qualified leaders and teachers. It means having the right kind of curriculum. It means in the cases where it's needed, you know, breakfast and lunch, and in some schools now, dinner, to make sure that kids are actually getting fed during the day. Um, having the social service supports. We have um, the, a higher poverty rate in this country for kids than any other industrialized country, about one out of every four children. Homelessness has in, doubled in this last decade. Um, it's silly to say that schools should ignore all of that. If a kid doesn't have a place to be, if they've been evicted, and so on, you need the service uh, supports to enable that child to be in school, fed, uh, able to concentrate, and the school resources to meet those expectations. I'm going to take a slightly different spin. I mean, all of us are, are in agreement that what we need in this country is a, a dramatic increase in the level of, of investment in children. And I think all of us would agree with the principal who said, or whoever it was in the film who said, uh, it costs more to educate poor children. We just need to accept that, right? Um, but, but, but I, I would say one thing slightly differently about the expectations and resources issue. I think that even at the level, the criminally low level of resources that our schools, our city schools are struggling with right now, they can do better than they are doing right now with these resources, right? And a part of that really is this issue of teacher expectations, right? Um, and again, it won't get every kid to the level that we want, but there are some kids who, when teachers change practice, can begin to do better almost right away. Mm. I want to ask you to comment on that. Well, I'm, I'm ready to jump right in, oh. okay? You know. We have, and you go back into the history of our country, and you've had some of that, and you all are aware of it, money counts. But I don't want this whole program to be about money. I believe that race, socioeconomics, where you live. When I was growing up, if you lived on the wrong side of the tracks, you didn't have running water, some of those kind of things. We actually adjust expectations downward for those children. I see it when I visit schools. I see the less curriculum, less rigorous. I see in the assignment of teachers, where you have high teacher turnover, or class size, or how you spend time, or how you utilize all the resources, or the ability of the culture to continue to learn and learn from their mistakes. I see that at the base of a lot of these low expectations. I see it in how we uh, are adjusting scores across the country under the no child left behind or the you know, race to the top or states were you know, making cut scores on the park or different kind of things. I think we have a differential expectations based on race or socioeconomic or who your parents were and I think we've got to address that. Well, teacher skills. Teachers. are a resource. That's right. I mean, the, the resources and how much are we to... investing in teacher skills? Exactly. Far, <laughs> far too little and often far too little, especially for teachers in the schools where the needs are the greatest, where you may have this revolving door of you know, beginning teachers in and out who aren't getting professional learning opportunities. And so the expectations and the skills you know, are the, you know, have to go together. Because if you say, well, uh, jump over this bar. I've got a high bar. I know I have high standards because nobody can meet them. That's been the way the standards argument has sometimes gone. Um, and you're not bringing the scaffolding and the skills and the you know, um, human investments 
So you need the, clarity. Yep. You need clarity of what those outcomes are to be. You need coherence in your pathway. And you need capacity. And that's what you're talking about, building capacity. When we're spending on every educational dollar in most places less than three cents of the dollar on building capacity of the most valuable resource we have, and that is the people who make the difference with the children and meet them every day, that's almost criminal. When we make teaching an isolated event where they go in a room and close the door and we talk about collaboration, we give them no time to collaborate. We don't arrange the schedules. We, we, or we say it's after school. And then we load up their classrooms with wide uh, variety of uh, children who have different needs, whose those needs are not resourced, you're bound to get what we've got. You do not find that in all areas of any school district. So we, we have by design said in some areas, you're gonna get a pretty good education. 20 to 25% of most school districts have children that they will point you to that got a great education. You can find that here in Chicago, you can find that anywhere in Illinois. But what we don't point to is the 25 or 40 percent who are getting a very poor education, very non-skilled workforce, very tight classrooms. Charles. I, I want to stay on the teacher expectation and I want sure. to stay on your own experience. Tell me if my understanding of that experience yeah. is wrong. My, my, I mean, part of what you did is, is, is set a much higher bar for all students in Montgomery County, the North Star, as you call yeah, it. Yeah, well, let but me but, talk just a minute about sure. that so it's not confused. I asked the students what they wanted to do. I think we don't listen enough. You know what they wanted to do? They wanted to have a career, and they wanted to go on to, you know, advanced training for that career, whether it was college or some trade school or something like that. I asked the parents, what did they want their children to do? Well, first of all, they wanted them out of the basement, you know. <laughs> And uh, second of all, they wanted them to be able to be happy. So, you know, they wanted them fulfilled, but they also wanted them prepared for the next step. So their grandkids would not be living in poverty. I asked the teachers what they expected from their own children, and that's what they expected from their own children. Guess what? That's the North Star. Mm. Then what you need to do is say, under what conditions can we get everybody there? Now go ahead with your question. That, 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 well, to be even more specific, one of the things that you encouraged was putting more minority students uh, into advanced classes and AP classes. And if my understanding is correct, you ran into some resistance from teachers who did not believe that those students could perform in those classes. That's right. Can you fix educational outcomes until you fix poverty? to me is, is a question of the chicken or an egg. The schools and what happens in schools is in a lot of ways the manifestation of what's happening in those communities. As long as we have poverty in our communities, we won't be able to provide a fair education in schools.